Good morning. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you on this June 14th online Sunday service for First Presbyterian Church. I welcome, of course, all of our brothers and sisters who join us regularly, as well as everyone else who is visiting us, uh, perhaps for the first time. Uh, may this service be a blessing to you as we come before the Lord to worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to firstly thank all of you who um, thank you for your, your offerings and your continual financial and prayerful support of the church with the news of reopenings happening all across the, the province and the nation. Uh, I'm sure many of us are um, eager to, to gather again. We, we, want to, we are looking forward to a time when we can worship together. Um, but I did want to let you know that that session, uh, the Board of Managers and the Leading with Care teams and committees have uh, kind of created a subcommittee to come together and talk about what this would look like for us. And so we are working actively on a plan for a phased reopening. And although right now, as it stands, we don't have uh, a date, a solid date or um, a timeline um, in regards to this, it is something that we are taking careful consideration of. So I would invite you and ask that you would pray for us as we try and discern and as we try and uh, determine what uh, the best course of action is for our church family and congregation. Now, in uh, the bulletin that went out yesterday, I had invited some people to uh, send us pictures or send me pictures of their gardens or house plants, and I wanted to thank you. You may have had a chance to see some of those pictures at the beginning of the service, um, but I think it's just a beautiful way to share a little piece of our lives while also celebrating the beauty of God's creation. I hope you've had a chance to also watch our recap video for 2019. Thank you, Gene Hall, for putting that together for us. It was, a wonder it was wonderful to look back to all that we have to celebrate and remember. And I hope that it's also something that helps us to, to eagerly and prayerfully uh, wait for, for when we're able to gather again. Um, and I, I hope that this time that we are spending apart uh, would help us to value even more deeply the things that we miss and allow us the chance to re-examine our hearts in faith. As we pray for what comes next, let us lean more closely to what God, the Lord, uh, desires out of our lives in, in the faith and hope that it is Him who continues to sustain His church um, and who continues to sustain you, His children, with every breath and every step that you take. 
Let us join together now in the call to worship. My people hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. Things we heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants, we will tell the next generation. Tell them of the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded us to teach our children. So the next generation would know him, even those yet to be born. Then they will put their trust in the Lord and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Let us worship the Lord. This week, we welcome Wilma Coiter to be our scripture reader as she leads us in two passages. I'm reading from the New International Version, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet, and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. The New Testament reading is taken from Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, He who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. The red letter passage for us today is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. In my wrestling and in my doubts, 
in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa oh you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go in my questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness i will follow you my lighthouse my lighthouse i will trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore i won't fear what tomorrow brings with each morning i'll rise and sing my god's love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea whoa oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness i will follow you my lighthouse my lighthouse trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore far before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storm before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storms far before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storms far before us you're the brightest you will lead us through the storms my lighthouse my
This week we are returning to our red letter series where we are in the 19th week of examining uh, the red lettered words of Jesus Christ that are printed in many Bibles. And I have to say that the next couple of weeks are going to be uh, somewhat challenging for, for me and uh, perhaps for some of us. They, they are not always easy topics. And in a time where we are so, um, where we have this isolation fatigue, we are often looking for a feel good, a, a hopeful message from the Lord. Um, but we know as well as Christians, as we have examined week after week, that sometimes to be called a Christian is, is hard work. People say that to be a Christian is actually at once one of the easiest and simplest things uh, to, to do, but also one of the most difficult. We know this because as we've been examining the red letter uh, words, we've seen how Jesus has been not only taking the, the commandments of the Old Testament, of the, the Ten Commandments and beyond, and, and um, reminding us how important they are, but he is also elevating the standard for us. Uh, which which puts, in, in a very real sense, a, a lot of pressure on us. But we have to also be reminded that, you know, through Pentecost, through the coming of the Holy Spirit, through the grace of Jesus Christ, we know that anything that is impossible for us is made possible in Him. In our struggles, in our day-to-day -day lives, we are never left alone. God is with you. God is with us. And so we can find hope and strength in that. And yet in the midst of that, it is our purpose, it is our goal to, to strive continually, to seek after what it means to live faithfully to, to a loving and gracious God, to the very best of our abilities. Last week we uh, spoke about um, the, the importance around the idea that all human beings are created in the likeness of God especially in the midst of everything that is happening in the States and across Canada as well um, with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, we have to be reminded that whenever we go outside, whenever we meet a person, uh, regardless of who they are, where they come from, what their background is, they were created in God's image. And so we must, as Christians, learn to honor that. We, we must learn to recognize that and, and always um, interact with other people with that knowledge that they are precious in God's sight. You know, from the beginning of time, as, as we had examined, God had created man and women. Uh, and when he did, he, he created them to, to come together in, in kind of a partnership, in a, a covenantal relationship, in a marriage, if you will. And this Im image of a marriage between um, Adam and Eve was, is, is meant to represent the, this beautiful, self-giving relationship that is ultimately revealed to us as being the relationship between Christ and the church, his bride. And we read of this, this idea, this metaphor of, of the church, of Jesus Christ being his bride all through, throughout scriptures. He creates uh, people to, to be bound in a divine love, in a, co a covenant that is otherworldly, that is holy. Um, but as we, we know, when Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God and sin entered into, the curse of sin had entered into humanity, everything from that point, everything about humanity became perverted and distorted by sin. And so that happens to the relationship between man and woman. As a result, we live in a world that is where everything is really, um, in a sense, over-sensualized and, and sexualized. Uh, we know very well that they use sex to sell almost everything. And I am so encouraged when there are people, um, groups, or, uh, or who, individuals who speak so loudly against this. Because there is a growing awareness of the impact that this has on people, psychologically, emotionally. And we know as well today that Addiction to pornography is a very real problem that is impacting millions and millions of people. Especially as I think of my children and, and how they are growing up so fast. My oldest son, Abel, 
Uh, he just learned to tie his shoe a couple of days ago. Um, it only took him a few minutes, and and then this yesterday he he came up to me and and told me that one of his teeth was wiggling, and and I don't remember at that age being six years old and having to and having done all of these these milestone things, um, you know, and 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 it just seems kind of crazy that he's growing up so quickly. But I also recognize that he's growing up very quickly in a world that is dangerous, a world that is filled with temptation, a world that has so much um, that is that teaches so much toxicity and um, and 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 so much depravity, and and it's just it worries me. Uh, I I I to be honest, I I don't know what it's going to be like when. Uh, when they grow up older and they they are faced with the realities of what the world and what media and what movies um, are like, so once again, I'm I'm so thankful for the people who are these days standing up for um, various human rights. Uh, there's this one campaign that is uh, founded by a Layla Micklewait, um, which is called Trafficking Hub uh, Campaign, and. It is an anti-trafficking. It is a campaign that is uh, powered by the anti-trafficking organization called Exodus Cry, um, which is a non-religious, non-partisan effort to uh, hold the largest uh, porn website in the world accountable for enabling and actually profiting off of the mass sex trafficking, rape, and exploitation of women and minors. The campaign has, at this point in time, been signed. This petition has been signed uh, by people from 192 countries. Um, I think they've gotten over a million uh, signatures at this date. And the campaign is supported by over 300 child protection and anti-trafficking organizations, as well as experts on and survivors of sex trafficking. It is a, a sad truth that the world is filled with, with so much uh, pain and so much abuse and so much exploitation. For me growing up, and I'm sure for many, uh, Christian education reduced the idea of lust to a set of do's and don'ts. You were told that you didn't look at pornography. You were told that you abstained from premarital sex and masturbation. You didn't go to clubs or watch certain movies. You uh, perhaps put on a purity ring and committed to remain a virgin until you got married. And there are all these things that you, you did. Um, but the unfortunate side effect of this kind of almost black and white, almost legalistic view of what you did not do as a Christian often makes the issue about me as the individual, about protecting and safeguarding myself that I am supposed to guard myself for my future spouse. I am supposed to guard myself for my, my spouse and my, my wife or, or whatever it may be. And, you know, it, it was more about I, the things that I did not do, the, uh, the things that I promised to do, um, the things that I did not watch, etc. But I think we often miss a point that Jesus points out for us today. You know, from, from la the, a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at Jesus talking about anger, um, often we, we think about our own anger, but Jesus' primary concern is not for the self. It is always pointed to the other. It is always pointing to, to the other person and concerned about their feelings um, and how my feelings and my deeds are actually affecting the other person. Jesus calls us to be the one to go and reconcile with them. And Jesus, by modeling the ultimate self-sacrifice, is, is asking us to do the same, to be self-sacrificial in, in how we are faithful and how we are obedient to God's law. Because that is ultimately what it is about. It is honoring and glorifying God, but also loving others. In essence, you know, God, Jesus calls us to consider just how my words, my actions, and how even my own secret hidden thoughts impacts others and how we honor, or in this case, would dishonor them. As we read today in Proverbs, it tells us to guard our hearts with, with vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 15, which we will eventually get to at some point in time during the, the series, when he says, 
It is what comes out of a person's mouth that comes out of from their heart. It is not what goes in that defiles, defiles a person. It says whatever comes out of our mouths ultimately comes from our hearts, and that is what defiles a person. So do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying that how we think about a person, how we hold them and, and care for them, even in our hearts, how we uphold them and how we respect them, it all begins in the heart. How we do this actually matters. It is not enough to just respect a person in our deeds and actions. Um, for, for Korean culture, the way you speak to them or, or how you bow when you greet an elder um, or you know anything like that. It is not enough to just protect one's dignity by, by their own actions. It is something that needs to be cultivated in the heart. How I can care for and love my neighbors. And so it, it calls us to examine closely how we feel about certain people, um, about the stereotypes and prejudices and biases we carry about them. When Jesus talks about adultery, he speaks not of the physical act. He says that, you know, um, he, he says that you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, uh, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If you just look at another person with, with lustful intent, it is the same as committing adultery within the heart. We have to remember that Jesus says this because for Jesus, every person is imago Dei or uh, created in the image of God. So you can imagine the heartbreak he has for his children who look upon each other in such a way. Because to, to look upon a person with lust also is, is not only um, perhaps a betrayal to, to, to myself and whether it be if I married my, my spouse, but it is an act of actually dehumanizing it is an act where we are objectifying another person. It is an act where I am reducing someone to become a tool or a product, uh, an object of, of, one's, uh, of my own personal gratification and pleasure. And therein, I believe, lies a great problem. Jesus is not only concerned for the person who is doing the looking and for their hearts, and, and how allowing ourselves to do this can actually poison our, our hearts. Jesus is deeply concerned for the one who is being looked upon. For he, he is deeply concerned for their dignity and the divine image of, of, of God bearing beauty that they carry. And so Jesus tells, is telling us to look upon another with lust is the same as committing adultery. Once again, Jesus takes something that simply that people have simply reduced to a do not do this and rightly elevates it to a holier standard. And in the midst of this, in, in the face of, of this, we may be tempted to simply say, people are often tempted to say, well, if they, what they don't know will not hurt them. Right? What happens in my heart, what happens in my mind is private, is personal, and therefore any thoughts that I have, um, whether it be uh, utterances of, uh, that come out of anger, whether it be certain language or certain impure thoughts, all of these things, as long as I do not utter them, uh, it, it won't hurt anyone. And that's what people, I would argue, were doing with the commandments and laws of the Old Testament. Actually, it's, it's probably what a lot of us do as well. We are taking the rules and laws and using them either for the purpose of building up our own self-righteousness by ticking off all of the checkboxes and saying, look at how holy I am, or then negotiating them and wondering as we, we look at them, how close can I get to sin without sinning as we examined, uh, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. But Jesus is saying that the curse of sin and death is more than just what bubbles up to the surface of our lives. Sin actually has a toxic effect on one's heart. And when it is allowed to fester there, hidden away, um, it is not only poisonous to the individual who, who does the hiding, 
It distorts and perverts the holistic, loving, caring community, the, the, the church of God as it is meant to be in, in a subversive, quiet, silent, toxic way. So much so that Jesus says that if even your eye causes you to sin, if it causes you to look upon another with lust, it is better to tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, then it is better for you to, to cut it off and throw it away. Now, we would be hard-pressed to believe that Jesus actually meant this literally, because we know that if he did require that we chop off every bit of ourselves that causes us to sin, then there would not be much left of us. But Jesus says this to, to highlight the, the severity of sin, especially the severity of this kind of sin, that the objectifying and dehumanizing of a person for our own pleasure, that it is an atrocious, that it is an atrocious thing uh, to look at a person and not see and value them for the person who is created fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. I have grown up often unaware, uh, ignorant of how movies and shows have portrayed different races according to certain exploiting stereotypes. Uh, often Asians are, are uh, depicted as fragile or as obedient. They are depicted as mysterious and mystic. Blacks are often depicted as being exotic and wild. And all of these kind of things that further push uh, that further pushes the enemy's agenda of, of segregating people and, and dividing them according to man-made categories, making other human beings object of either our hate or even our fantasies. And a lot of times people will excuse it by saying, well, can't we pay them an, a compliment? This becomes a theme for what Jesus is preaching. He says that to call someone a fool is just as bad as murder. And so to look at someone with lust is the same as exploiting them. Because this is what sin ultimately is. You know, at, at best, it, it leads to our dishonoring and degrading of another human being. At worst, it leads to the absolute exploitation and abuse of others. And sin does not stop there. You know, sin is, is of course, disobedience to, to the commands of God, but it is going against the, the grand holy rule, divine rule, and order of how God created things to be. Paul writes that the disregarding of the call to live holy, righteous, and pure lives does not only disregard the person, but God himself. That when we sin, um, when we look upon another person with lust, when we dehumanize them, when we objectify them, we are not only dehumanizing uh, them and we are not only disregarding them as a person, but we are disregarding God himself. And then Jesus is saying to look upon a person with lust does not only exploit the, the woman or man you look upon, but it exploits God himself, for they carry his likeness. And so it is a, a perversion and distortion of what God created uh, as very good. These very good people, this humanity that was meant uh, for, for relationship with him, that was meant for holiness, that was meant for purity. And while the things that happen in secret and in the dark and behind closed doors of our minds and hearts are easy to, to hide, we know that sin, and especially hidden sin, has a way of tainting and poisoning the heart when left unconfessed before the throne of grace. And those kind of sins, when left unrepented, eventually find their way to the surface one way or the other. In how we treat ourselves, in how we treat others, and how we live faithfully or not to God. And we have to be reminded, as Jesus says, that the cost of sin is eternal. And so the call here is, is a call to repent. To repent of the hidden lustful intents of our hearts. Or the lustful intents that we've had in the past. That we have left unrepented. 
It is a call to, to repent and a call to, to guard our hearts with vigilance and prayer because it is the wellspring of our lives. It is to be like Job who said that he kept, he created a covenant with his eyes so that he would not look upon another with lust. The psalm says, how can a young person keep their way pure? It is by living according to every word of God. And that in our repenting, we also ask the Lord to to give us not eyes of this world, but eyes of God, so that we may learn to view each person created in his image as precious and wonderful, worthy of all dignity and honor and respect to live honoring others and never dehumanizing them, never de-imago deing them, never robbing them of their image-bearing beauty. Because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his torturous death, was to put an end to this. Jesus' life was to model this. Christ made a way when when things are impossible for humanity to, uh, to be possible by grace. And so while we live in a world that is so filled with uh, sensual and over-sexualized media, and when it may feel almost impossible when every song that we sing and every commercial and movie we watch uh, draws our mind into the temptation of lust, we know that by the power of God, by, by His grace, that things are made possible. And so we ask God to help us to see every time we look at a person, not an object of our pleasure or of our desire, but an object of, or a person, not an object, but, but a person who is worthy and who is desired by God, who is created by him to be in his likeness. And so we, we must come before him because it seems now more than ever, we must learn to, as, the, as Proverbs reads, to let our eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. To ponder the path of your feet so that all your ways will be sure. To not swerve to the right or to the left and to turn your foot away from evil. Jesus is calling us to live lives in purity, not only outwardly, but in our hearts. And that is sometimes really, really, oftentimes, most times, really, really hard to do. But we ask the Holy Spirit to help us in this. For we know that in, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome our greatest sins and our greatest t- temptations. And any sins that we have left uh, unrepented are received and hung on that cross, forgiven and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are born again in his grace and in his mercy. And so we praise the Lord for for this good news and for this hope that it is never too late. And so I invite you at this time to take a moment in prayer and to examine our hearts and and ask that our hearts would be molded to hearts that, that not only honor ourselves and our own bodies and our own relationships and our own marriages, but also that we would learn to honor other human beings as more than just people who bring us satisfi- satis- satisfaction for our own desires and pleasure, to view them as precious and holy as, as children of God created in His image. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Creator God, you who are the author of every life, we give you praise and we give you thanks for every person that is on this earth. For Lord Heavenly Father, though we are a wicked and sinful people, you have created each of us fearfully and wonderfully made in your likeness. 
And so, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for often forgetting that, for allowing the temptation and allowing ourselves to look upon other people um, and dehumanizing them, robbing them of their God-given dignity, robbing them of their humanity for the sake of our own desires and for our own pleasure. We repent for this world and we ask for your grace and mercy for this world that is so uh, intoxicated by lust and sensualization and immorality, Heavenly Father. And we ask for your grace and mercy. Heavenly Father, in such a world, how can we um, hope that our children, how can we hope that uh, the young, how can we hope that uh, the, the fathers and mothers, uh, how can we hope that we would be able to uh, stand strong? But Heavenly Father, where we are weak, we know that you are strong. In fact, we know that in our weaknesses, your, your power is made perfect. And so may we depend upon you, O Lord, that you would redeem us, Heavenly Father, from, uh, from our uh, adulterous hearts, Heavenly Father. For Heavenly Father, we know that it is in your desire that we honor one another, that we love and care for one another, that we are faithful to, to one another, that we are faithful to our spouses and partners, that we are faithful to our husbands and wives, that we are faithful to our brothers and sisters in caring for them and protecting them, beginning for how, from how we uh, view them and how we, we uh, hold them in our hearts. Heavenly Father, teach us to have your eyes, give us your eyes, so that we may look upon one another with love and with respect, with compassion, with honor, and with dignity. Father, Lord, we give you thanks for every person um, who has been able to, to continue to, to give Heavenly Father to, our, to the church in their gifts and donations and offerings. In these trying and difficult times, many people are struggling financially, Heavenly Father. And so we ask for your, for your blessing upon them as well. For everything that has been given to the church, dear Lord, we, over the last couple of months, we ask that you would breathe upon it and use it for the building of your kingdom, that you would use it for the building and for, uh, for the building of, of your church, um, that you would use it uh, for your glory, O oh Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would receive the hearts of those of us who wish we could give more and who were un or who were unable to give. Receive our hearts as an act of worship that is pleasing to you as well. We continue to pray for those who uh, are putting themselves at risk as they protest police brutality, as they protest racial injustices, uh, for the people who feel so passionately about social injustices. Heavenly Father, may we stand in solidarity with them, even if it is just through our prayers. Heavenly Father, may you teach us, the church, to not stay silent on these issues, but continue to humbly uh, learn and to listen to have compassion and to have empathy and to be an ally to those who need it most. As we look towards the eventual reopening of our church, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your patience. And we ask that you would help us, Heavenly Father, to see things as you see them, that we may not be quick to judge, that we may not be quick to grow angry, but that we would be slow to anger and slow to speak. Heavenly Father, as we surrender and entrust all things into your hands. We pray all of these things and lift up every member of our congregation and our family members, every member of this community and beyond to you, into your care. We pray all of these things in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Now may you grow in the knowledge of the grace of God, the peace and heart of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit that chases out all fear and even death and sets us free into a life of love and abundance and go to fulfill the very purpose for which you were created, called, and sent. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone.